Shalom. First and foremost, I want to give all praises to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh Bahasham, Yahweh Shai Bahasham, Rachakurash. Double honors to the apostles, the bishops, and the elders at Great Millstone who rule well. Peace and salutations as always to the elect. And I wanted to do a response. All right. And as you can see, the elder Karata Zaba, the head of the GMS branch at Baltimore. GMS Biblical Defenders Subscribe and Be Edified. As you can see the title of this video, IUIC, all right, don't hate Esau, the shame of the gospel. All right. And pretty much I'm doing this video um, because anyone who's teaching these scriptures, all right, should know the breakdown of Deuteronomy 23 and 7. Anybody, all right, who's, you know, um, going out. And teaching our people the scriptures, all right, they should be able to go into the scriptures and be able to break these things down, especially at this point where these breakdowns have been out there, all right. And Bishop Nathaniel knows about the true breakdown of Deuteronomy 23 and 7, as we'll get into it. But it makes no sense that in 2024 we still have Israelites using Deuteronomy 23 and 7, all right. <laughs> as a means to say we can't hate Esau now the word hate when you go into it it just means a strong dislike all right we hate a lot of things but we're not uh justified in going and executing judgment on Esau because ultimately we have to wait on the Lord all right there's a lot of things we hate there's a lot of things we want to pass judgment on all right we hate sodomites we hate a lot of the wickedness that goes on in this world <laughs> But we're not justified in going and establishing our own judgment. All right. Some people hate eggs. Some people hate ketchup. Some people hate, you know, French fries. There's a lot of things you can hate. It just means you have a strong dislike. All right. And when you go into the scriptures, um, there's a hardcore judgment against the biblical Edomites. All right. When you get the book of Obadiah. All right. When you go to the book of Malachi, the Lord himself says he hates Esau, which Paul quotes. All right. And Romans, the ninth chapter and the scriptures tells us, ye that love the Lord, hate evil. All right. You should hate evil. And Esau, all right, is evil in the flesh. He's the personification of evil. OK, so, yes, we hate Edomites. All right. Now, there are people in this world who happen to look like Edomites who are actually Israelites. This is why we have to clarify things and we have to keep things. All right. in a spiritual perspective. All right, because this world capitalizes off of, you know, terms like black, white and this and that. But I'm going to play this video and then we're going to get into some history as to what this really means. Um, and anyone teaching this word. All right. Should should know and understand this breakdown. OK, that's why you have to uh, get the sincere milk of the word. All right. Before you go out there professing yourself to be a teacher. But let's listen. <laughs> question one more question and then i'm gonna try to give y'all a break all right deuteronomy 23 and 7 it says when it says not to hate esau what is the difference between the thought of hate and praying for destruction upon them just wanted to make sure my thoughts don't turn to hate how do i separate the two all right good good question right now we are not we are commanded not to hate esau right go go to it uh deuteronomy 23 and 7 yes, sir. right now hating him and praying for his destruction are not the same, right? Because, well, well, well let's get into it. Read. Well, you, you pray for the destruction of those you hate, okay? But again, you know, this camp has been going in more and more of a Christian, you know, a Catholicism way. But it's not, you know, again, we've, we've been, you know, trained, you know, to love what hates us and to run away from hate. You know, there's a, you know, there's a time for hate according to the scriptures, all right, we'll get that in the book of Ecclesiastes. There's a time for love. There's a time for hate. There's a time to embrace. There's a time to refrain from embracing. Hate has its time. Hate is okay. All right, but to act upon that hate, all right, and to use your emotions as a means to go out and to exude your own judgment is where you sin. As the scriptures say, be ye angry and sin not. All right, so it's nothing wrong with hate you know this world has done nothing but hated the most high his son the the holy people 
we've received nothing but hate from this world. All right. Now, of course, we wait on the judgment of the Lord. All right. But we want the judgment to hit this place. We want the judgment to hit these people because we hate them. All right. And again, you have Edomites who look like so-called black people. You have Edomites who look like so-called Chinese. So it's not based upon, all right, a physical appearance. It's more of a spirit. See, and these are the things that have to be broken down. This is why our apostles and elders constantly harp on the fact that you have Israelites all right, because of a scattering that that that, that are going to come looking like different nations. All right. That are considered heathen or considered our enemies. All right. The scriptures tell you they that hate thee have lifted up their heads and have consulted to wipe the nation of Israel off the planet Earth. OK, let's keep listening. Uh, verse seven, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, verse seven. Read. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite. Meaning hate an Edomite, read. And abhor doesn't mean hate. Abhor means to detest, to look at with disdain. Okay? It's, it's a difference. Like when you're, you're, you're you know, in the, in the law, when you're rib, when your wife is on her cycle, all right, she would have to, you know, be away from you. All right, if you saw her, if she was around you and you knew, you, you would be like, ugh. It's a difference from abhorring and hating. But anyway, let's keep listening. For he is thy brother. He's our brother. That's our twin brother, our ugly, hasty, pale, hairy twin brother. Right? That's our twin brother. So the Bible says you shouldn't hate him. And we don't. We don't hate him. Do we? Right, we don't hate him. Come on now. We couldn't. How could we? We can't even... When you, when you understand what these elites are doing, you know... I mean, you, you see everyday Edomites, just like whatever about them. But the people who run this world, the Edomites who run this world, who run this beast system, or who will lead in this high level rebellion against the Lord. I mean, we hate all Edomites. But when it comes to the rulers of Esau, Edom, and what they're doing to the earth, man, and what they've done to blaspheme the name of the Most High, his image, to blaspheme the tabernacle, to blaspheme the angels, they've done nothing but wage war against our power and us. Right. And again, they've done nothing but evil. And the scriptures say, ye that love the Lord, Psalms 97 and 10, hate evil. Execute the hatred we have for him with all our power. You can hate the white man all the way to the bank and he will still wake up and be infinitely better off than you. Doesn't matter. Right. And that's speaking of the elites. All right. And we're not justified in, in, in waging a judgment. Now, anyway, enough of these guys. Let's just go to the book of Deuteronomy 23 and 7, all right? Because when you read this chapter, it's dealing with people who are excluded from the congregation, the assembly, all right? The camp, the Israelites, okay? Now, it starts, he that is wounded in his stones, or he that hath his privy member cut off shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. <laughs> so... Tran the the, the uh, trans people they they <laughs> you couldn't come into the the you know the congregation of the Lord, all right. Or if you had issues in your 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 your, your ball sack, you know, prostate cancer, you know, stuff like that back then, you wouldn't be permitted to come into the congregation. You know, a bastard shall not enter into the congregation. Which a bastard is one who uh, ultimately is born of a heathen father. All right, who lays with an Israelite mother, he's not going to enter into the congregation of the Lord. And there's other, you know, you know, um, other things that would, you know, uh, lead to you being a bastard. But it's dealing with who who can and can't enter into the congregation of the Lord. An Ammonite or a Moabite can't enter into the congregation of the Lord. So when you get. All right. Uh, verse seven. OK, is, you know, um, it says thou shalt not abhor an Edomite. All right, which is the test. All right, let's look up the word, word abhor real quick. Let's do it first like this. Let's do a web search. Abhor means to regard with disgust. It says in hatred, but it doesn't mean to hate. All right, disgust. Okay, let's also look it up here. Let's see here. The word abhor is thayab. Abhor, to be abominable, all right, 
in a ritual sense, in an ethical sense, to loathe, to abhor, to regard as an abomination in a ritual sense. That's why I brought up the situation with, you know, a woman when she's on her cycle. Ritually, she will be considered unholy. All right. So you would abhor her. You would loathe her being around, you know, under that first covenant. All right. And even now. All right. But we're all in, you know, certain situations. Brothers don't have different houses. So you, you have to be in the same place as her in a lot of situations. But that's how it was back then. So. Deuteronomy 23 and 7 says, Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. All right. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou was a stranger in his land. All right. And when you look at the judgments of the Edomites, all right, when you look at the judgments of the Egyptians in the scriptures, it's pretty harsh, but the harshest is on the Edomites. I mean, when you get the book of um, Obadiah, <laughs> Okay, there's a hardcore judgment against the, the Edomites, right? Obadiah 1, all right, and 18, this gets to the point. It says, In the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, the tabernacle of David, Judah, and Ephraim being reunited, all right, with the spiritual power, and the house of Esau for a stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining out of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. So there's a hardcore judgment on Esau. All right, again, Malachi tells us what? Okay, Malachi 1 and 3, And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. All right, I loved Jacob and I hated Esau. Again, this was, you know, quoted by the Apostle Paul in Romans, the uh, ninth chapter. But when you get Ezekiel 25, all right, he's going to stretch out his hand against uh, uh, Edom. All right, 25 and 14, I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. Ezekiel 36, uh, 35 speaks against judgment coming against Edom. Um, let's see if they talk, if they, you know. Um, uh, let's get Romans, the ninth chapter, where Paul quotes this. <laughs> So are they going off? Romans 9 and 13, as it is written, all right, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And again, I brought this out earlier. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Let's get that in Psalms 97 and 10. Psalms 97 and 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil, and he preserveth the souls of his saints. What's that, Psalms 137? Get that, and then we'll get into the lesson. Um, Psalms 137, I haven't quoted that. We ain't brought that out in a minute. Nah. Well, this is one, all right, where David is calling for the Lord to remember the children of Edom, all right, and ultimately judge them. O daughter of Babylon, who ought to be destroyed, who Esau runs in the modern day, Babylon, he runs the daughter of Babylon. Happy shall he be that taken the dash of thy little ones against the stone. So there's a judgment written against Esau that's associated with hatred. Okay, um, what was I thinking of? Um, or maybe Psalms 139. All right, Psalms 139 and 21. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? All right. And am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Psalms uh, 83, real quick. All right. Because that, you know, as we're bringing out all of these scriptures, this scripture we're getting ready to go into is not even talking about Edomites. Okay. Psalms 83 and 2, for lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. And they have taken crafty counsel against thy people and have consulted against thy hidden ones and have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. They have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee, the tabernacles of Edom. So do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. They that hate thee have lifted up the head and, and consulted, all right, to cut us off from being a nation. All right. <laughs> they that hate thee. Let's look up the word hate. Just to see what it means. 
All right. And when we go out into this world, we use wisdom. We're not, you know, screaming at Edomites, telling them they're the devil and telling them they go be Joe. We, we use wisdom as we go out into this world. But yes, we hate Edomites. Shan Shana. All right. To be hateful, to hate. Hater, enemy, to be hated. All right. And so forth. And hate at the end of the day just means a strong dislike. See? And there's a time for that pursuant to the book of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, and the eighth verse. Okay? Ecclesiastes 3 and 8. A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. We're not in the time of loving Esau. Look at what he's doing. Look at where he's trying to take it. He's trying to ultimately hijack the Heavenly Father's creation, man. Now, when King David got in rulership, right? First Chronicles 18, I believe. All right, First Chronicles 18 and 13. And he put garrisons in Edom, had people watching over him. And all the Edomites became David's servants. Thus the Lord preserved David wherever he went. So David waged war against the Edomites. Samuel, all right, hewed in pieces Agag, who was an Edomite. So did they go off? David put them in captivity. All right, the Edomites became David's subjects, all right, along with the other nations that he enslaved and took down. So the Edomites, all right, uh, David, <laughs> here it is, is destroying the Edomites. Another scripture, another point when dealing with this whole Deuteronomy 23 and 7, you know, which we've been going back and forth with this over the years, when you get, go two chapters over, all right, let's just jump down to the point in Deuteronomy, the 25th chapter. This is what Moses says. Remember what Amalek did unto thee, all right, this is the Lord speaking, all right, through Moses. All right, remember, never forget what Amalek did unto thee, all right, by the way, when you were come forth out of Egypt, all right, he attacked us, how he met thee by the way and smote, all right, the henmost of thee, the children and women, even all that were feeble behind thee when thou was faint and weary, and he, he feared not the Lord. Therefore shall be when the Lord has given thee rest from all thy enemies round about, and that's coming in the kingdom. After that, a thousand years in the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. So here it is. <laughs> Who's Amalek? Okay. They're descendants of Esau. Okay. Esau, Edom. The head tribe of Esau, the small hatch. So... Clearly, there's ending. I can keep going. There's so much indignation against Esau in the scriptures. So what's going on here in Deuteronomy 23 where it says, Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite? Well, first of all, let's look up what this really means, this word Edomite. Okay? All right? The word Edom is Adawam. All right? As you see here, Adamya, Adawamya. All right, but as you can see, Edomites, when you go to Strong's definition, right here it says, all right, from H123, CH27, an Edomite, descendants, all right, of Edom, Edomite, right? But when you click CH726, it takes you to Arawamia, all right, which is a Syrian, an Aramite, all right? As you can see here, it says, Ararumia, a clerical error for H-130, an Edomite. See, so this was a clerical error, all right, as the Ra and the Da looked the same in the Hebrew alphabet. All right. You see, Ararum, all right, but when you go here, Adawam, the Da and the Ra look the same. So it could have been either a mistake. All right, or they could purposely have put it there. Who knows? But we know when you go to the original scrolls, okay, when you go to the, 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 the volume of the book and put line upon line, precept upon precept, this couldn't be. 
because that would mean that David, Samuel, and many Israelites broke the law, all right, that Moses told them not to, to, to so-called abhor Edomites or hate Edomites is what they're trying to say. Okay, again, this is speaking of Arawamia because when you understand what the scripture is saying, all right, thou shalt not abhor uh, uh, a Syrian or Arawam, all right, which ultimately are the descendants of Abraham who were in this region. And it says thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian because that was a stranger in his land. This is basically talking about, all right, particular Israelites, all right, that ultimately descend from Abraham, all right, who were called sons of God, okay, through Isaac and so forth. If you keep going down the line, all right, they may not have been born amongst their countrymen, all right, in the promised land, okay, so you wouldn't abhor them, you wouldn't look down on them, you wouldn't detest them, just as you would have our people who were still in Egypt. This is speaking of the chosen lineage, all right, that are among these nations. Now, why did it say this? Let's go to Genesis, the 11th chapter, to find out the history. All right, then it says, the children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation, meaning ultimately they're going to come back as Israelites. Okay, they're, they're, these are Israelites in the third and fourth generation, the seeds return. Okay, so when you get the book of Genesis, the 11th chapter, let's get the history on Arawamia, all right, so that we can uh, have understanding of why it says that in Genesis or Deuteronomy, the 23rd chapter. We're going to go to uh, Genesis, the 11th chapter, and we'll just go to the point because what this chapter is tracking after the Tower of Babel was destroyed all right, pretty much the descendants of Shem, which was Noah's son, all right, where the chosen would be tracked through. And of course, Shem had five sons, but of Shem's five sons, the chosen came through our facts, as you can see there. Okay, so the chosen lineage be, can be tracked from Noah through Shem through our facts, and as you go down the line, okay. And follow these, these are sons of God. These are descendants of Adam, okay, through Seth, through Noah, through Shem, through our facts at, which that's how the chosen lineage is tracked. This would eventually lead, all right, to Abraham, who had Isaac, who had Jacob, when you follow this narrative. So Genesis 11, all right, and we're going to go to verse 26, okay? You have Terah. Now, who's Terah? You go into the scriptures, Terah, all right, Tharah, all right, I mean, it's the father of Abraham, all right, Tharah, all right, the father of Abraham, okay, it means a station or to delay, stationary, because the, the chosen lineage went off, okay, it was a delay, but as you can see, father of Abraham, so, when you follow what's going on here, Genesis 11 and 26, and Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Okay, so these are Terah's sons. These are all members of the chosen lineage. All right, and as you keep reading, now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begot Lot. All right which Lot, all right, is Abraham's nephew, all right, through his brother Haran's son. So Lot and Abram, all right, they all descend from the chosen lineage. Lot, all right, was a member of the chosen lineage, all right. And then it says, and Haran died, all right, before his father, Terah, in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. So they were in Ur of the Chaldees, Okay. So it says, and, and, and Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, which is Sarah. The name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishka. But Sarai was barren and had no child. 
All right, that's Sarah. She didn't have no children until later on in the story around Genesis the 17th, 18th, you know, uh, going into the 20th chapter. She had, you know, Isaac. All right, and Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, okay, and Sarai his daughter-in-law and his son Abram's wife. And they went forth from Ur unto Jaudes to go into the land of Canaan. And they came into Haran and dwelt there. Okay. All right. Which when you look up the name Haran or Haran. All right. We know Abram's brother Haran died. But they went into a land called Haran. All right. You look up. All right. Haran. Mount near a city to which Abraham migrated when he left Ur of the Chaldees where he stayed until his father died before leaving for the promised land loaded, located in Mesopotamia in Padan Aram. All right, Padan Aram, Arawam, all right? And we're going to show you, all right, what this is talking about, all right? At the foot of the Mount of Messias between Kabor and Euphrates, okay? When you look up a map, all right, that's right here, Padan Aram. All right, that's that's ultimately Syria. All right, so Abraham dwelt here for some time. All right, before heading, all right, to where he was headed to the promised land and so forth. Now, let's go back here. And let's go to the book of Genesis, um, the 22nd chapter. All right, let's go to Genesis 22. And we'll start at around 20. All right. It says, and it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she had also, all right, had borne children unto Nahor. All right. Huz, his firstborn. All right. And Buz, his brother. All right. And Kemuel, the father of Aram. All right. Aram, the father of Aram. Let's look up this word Aram. Right? Aram. Alright. Aram. Alright. Aram or Aramean is exalted. Alright. Grandson of Nahor, descendant, you know, and it's you know, a few people with that name, but Keep reading. All right, verse 22 and, and Kadesh and Hazo and Pildash and Jitlaf and Bethuel. Bethuel. All right. And all right. And Bethuel begat Rebecca. All right. Which ultimately would become Isaac's wife. All right. This is all one big close knit family. All right. Bethuel. All right. Remember that name. All right. Who's the father of Rebecca? Okay, these eight Milka did bear to Nahor, Abram's brother. Okay, and his concubine, whose name was Reuma, she bare also Taba, all right, and Gama, and Thahash, and Macha, all right. So you remember this name, Bethuel, okay, remember that name. That's the father of Rebekah, all right. So let's go to Genesis 24, all right, verses 1 through 3. All right, when it was time to get Abram a wife, all right, it says, And Abram was old and stricken in age, and the Lord blessed Abram in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, in thy hand, thy hand under my thigh, which that was an ancient way of making an oath. And I will make thee swear by the Lord God of heaven, Yahweh, and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son Isaac all right of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell all right he's not going to marry one of these women but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred which 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 you're going to find out those kindred are the Syrians all right but ultimately it's the sons of God that dwelt in that land all right which goes into Arawam see that clerical arrow we were talking about earlier 
but thou shalt go into my country and into my kindred and take a wife unto Isaac. All right. So let's jump down to verse 15. All right. Just getting the point out. And it came to pass before he had uh, uh, done, before he had done speaking that, behold, Rebekah came out who was born to Bethuel. Okay. It says, son of Milcah. Okay, which we read earlier, but Thule, I believe, was one of the sons of Nahor, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. All right. But this, 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 these are Abraham's descendants. They're all family. All right. And they're all descendants of the sons of God. Okay. So it says here, and it came to pass before that he had done speaking that, behold, Rebekah came out. Who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah. Yes, yeah, son of Milcah. All right, the wife of Nahor. So, yeah, Bethuel, all right, was uh, ultimately Abram's nephew. Okay, so again, these are all, this is all one big family. This is all the chosen lineage before they were called Israelites, man. Okay, the wife of Nahor, Abram's brother, all right, with her picture on her shoulder. Okay, let's jump to verse 28. In this same chapter, and the damsel ran and told them her uh, her mother these things, and Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. All right, and Laban ran unto the man in the well. So Laban is Rebecca's brother. All right, which is what ultimately Abraham's niece. Okay. So again, this is all one big family. All right, but if you if you know anything about Laban, all right, as we'll keep going. All right, let's look up Laban. Okay, Laban means uh, Laban means white, son of Bethuel, brother of Rebekah, and father of Leah and Rachel. Okay, you can look up more on him if you would like to, but let's go now. You're following the story. Let's go to. Genesis 25, okay, Genesis the 25th chapter, and we'll go to around the 19th verse, okay? These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abram begat Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, who was known as a damsel. So Rebekah was younger than, than uh, Isaac, okay? And she also had a guide with her, showing she was a younger woman. Okay, when you read Genesis, the 24th chapter, she's known as a damsel, okay, a young woman of marriageable age, okay, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian of Padan Aram, Padan Aram, okay, Padan Aram, all right, the sister, all right, of Laban, the Syrian, Let's look up this word Syrian. Okay. Aramya. Okay. Exalted. So this is still, all right, of the chosen lineage, but they're being called Syrians because of where they dwelt. And where they dwelt, all right, is that land, Haran, all right, and Padan Aram where Abram or Abraham had dwelt for some time before he went to the land of Canaan. See that? Padan Haram. Go back here. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram. All right. The sister to Laban, the Syrian. See? Laban, the Syrian point blank period okay <laughs> point blank period all right laban was known as a syrian these are abraham's descendants these are abraham's people man of the chosen lineage that were living in that land okay this is where isaac went to get his wife this is where jacob is going to go get his wife from amongst these people because when jacob all right finally goes to get his wife let's get a Genesis 25 or 28 rather let's start at 1 
And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father. Go to your uncle, right? And take thee a wife from his daughters. All right, as you can see, the marriages were close-knit, all right? As the nation is being established, it says, From thence, all right, of Laban, thy mother's brother. Instead, go to Padan Aram, to the house of your grandfather, Bethuel, and marry one of your uncle Laban's daughters. See? They're still of the chosen lineage, right? But they're known as Syrians. Laban was known as a Syrian. Okay? Let's go to the next chapter. Right? This is Genesis 29 and 1. And then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east, all right, the people of the east, <laughs> and he looked, and behold, a well of a field, and there were flocks of sheep lying by it, for out of that well they watered the flocks, and there was a great stone upon the mouth, all right, it says, I'm reading the NLT, and it was the custom to wait for the, all the flocks to arrive before removing the stone and watering the uh, animals afterward. The stone will be placed back up over the mouth of the well. And Jacob went over to the shepherds and asked, Where are you from, my friends? We are from Haran, they answered. We are from Haran. See, who's Haran? Okay, Abraham's brother. Okay, it says... Do you know a man named Laban? The grandson of Nahor? He asked, Yes, we do. They replied. All right, but we're, I'm Salakia. When it said we are from Haran, all right, Salakia, I, ma I made a mistake. When they say we are from Haran, they're talking about that land. All right, that land where, Har remember, Abram went, all right, to Haran. As a matter of fact, let's go to that point so we can show you when it says we are uh, from Haran. <laughs> I made a mistake. Because Abram's brother who died was named Haran, but Haran was also the name of that land. All right, this city which Abraham migrated when he left Ur of the Chaldees. All right, Haran is in Padan Aram. That's in the land of Syria, Salakia. So going back here, Genesis 29. And let's read this again. And four, and Jacob went to the shepherds and said, where are you from, my friends? They said, we are from Haran. That's in Syria, which is also known as Arawam. Yeah. Don't abhor a Syrian. All right. We are from Haran, they answered. Do you know a man named Laban, the grandson of Nahor? He asked. Yes, we do, they replied. All right. <laughs> So as you can see here, doing what his father Isaac told him to do, he's going to get a wife. Okay. It says, is he doing well? They answer, look, here he comes. Here comes his daughter, Rachel. All right. With the flock, with the flock now. They're like, well, here's his daughter right here. All right. And Jacob said, look, it's still broad daylight too early to round up animals. Why don't you water the sheep? And goats so they can get back out the pasture. All right. And when you keep going, let's go to the verse 13. All right. Then Jacob kissed verse 11. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. He explained to Rachel that he was her cousin on her father's side. All right. The son of her aunt Rebecca. So Rachel quickly ran and told her father Laban. Okay. As soon as Laban heard that his nephew Jacob had arrived, he ran out to meet him and he embraced and kissed him and brought him home when Jacob had told him his story. All right. Laban exclaimed, ye are my own flesh. All right. And blood after Jacob stayed with uh, Laban about a month. So there you go. He said, ye are my flesh and my blood. You're my family. Okay. My bone and my flesh. That, that's ancient talk for we're family. 
All right, but what was Laban known as? Let's go here. Let's just type it in. Laban was known as a Syrian. All right, how do you say Syrian in the Hebrew? Let's get it here. Awa Ramya. All right. So they were in that land. These are sons of God, descendants, all right, of, you know, Shem through our facts at the chosen lineage who were in this land. All right. This is why Abraham and Isaac, all right, were, were uh, Abraham told Isaac to go get a wife from there. Isaac told Jacob to go get a wife from there because these are their family that's over in that area. Before they were called Israelites, they were known as the sons and daughters of the Most High. All right. So let's go back to Deuteronomy. All right. The 23rd chapter. Okay. As a matter of fact, let's get Deuteronomy 26 real quick. Deuteronomy, the 26th chapter and the fifth verse. All right. And thou shalt speak and say be, uh, before the Lord thy God, a Syrian ready to perish was thy father. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few and became there a great nation, a mighty populace. Speaking of Jacob. All right. NLT, you must then say in the presence of the Lord, my an God, my ancestor, Jacob. All right. Was a wandering Aramean or a Rumya. All right, because ultimately Abram or Abraham was in that land for some time. OK, who went to live as a foreigner in Egypt. All right. So does this mean he was a literal Syrian? No, he's a, he's of the chosen lineage, but they were in that land of Syria. All right. Which is, you know, ultimately. All right. Padan Aram in Haran. Right. So going back to Deuteronomy 23 and 7, it says, And thou shalt not abhor an Edomite. Now, again, when you go to this word Edomite, this is an error. Okay? It says, Adam, all right, which Edom, Adawamya, all right, but Adamya. All right. And when you go to the Strong's definition, it says C H seven two six. All right, Arawamia, Aryan, Syrian, but also here they mistake it as Edomite sometimes. <laughs> right. It says a clerical error for H one three zero and Edomite. So it's an error. That was an error. Okay. So Deuteronomy 23 and 7 is saying ab abhor, not, all right, because there's this saying that Esau can be brought into the congregation of the Lord. <laughs> this is first covenant, right? No. <laughs> as strict as things were, the Lord is going to take the enemy, all right, of the Israelites and say, no, you don't hate him. Let him allow him into the congregation. No, this is talking about the chosen people who are in these areas. Just as the Jews looked down upon those who were uh, uh, born in foreign lands, the same thing is happening here. Thou shalt not detest a Ara, a, a, a Aramean or a Rumya or a Syrian, for he is thy brother. That's Abraham's people over there. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian because that was a stranger in his land, meaning you have descendants there. All right. And, so, and, and we know in ancient times you were called after the land you were born in. Right. Just like in the book of Acts, it say are not that e thou, uh, uh, Egyptian. OK. Let's get that real quick. <laughs> it's the book of Acts 21 and 38 are not thou that Egyptian which in the days of these made an uproar, all right, and led us out of the wilderness 
4,000 men that were murderers. Now, when you go into this, this is speaking of an Israelite, all right, but ultimately he practiced those Egyptian customs, most likely came out of the land of Egypt. When you go into the Josephus, all right, it breaks this down. As a matter of fact, see if one of the scholars break it down. It says, uh, this is uh, John Gill. Josephus speaks of one that came out of Egypt to Jerusalem and gave out that he was a prophet and deceived people and persuaded them to follow him to the Mount of Olives where they should see the walls of the city fall, yada, yada, yada. And when you go into it, this was an Israelite, all right? And many of the Jews follow him, all right? Like, like that dude, prophet, uh... <laughs> get that dude's name grandmaster j a prophet you know uh, he's, he's of the egyptian you know he coming in that egyptian madness but he's actually an israelite and persuading many israelites to ultimately uh follow him in his folly okay an egyptian false prophet did more mis mischief to the jews for he being a magician having got himself to believe the prophet came into the country of Judea and gathered about 30,000 people. Now, the Jews ain't go follow no damn heathen. They followed him, all right, and when you go into it, all right, to take and seize the Roman garrison and take the government of the people. So they, they ultimately followed him to take down Rome, right? They didn't want to pay taxes no more. This was the Jews, all right? But he was known as he called they call him an Egyptian, but he was an Israelite. All right, you're gonna have many Israelites, all right, that come out of the land of Egypt because ultimately, even when Yahawashai fled to Egypt, there was a, a, a population of one million plus Jews there. That's why he fled there. All right, so he can blend in amongst his people. Okay. The children that are begotten of them, okay, the children you have in these lands. All right, shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. Point blank period. That's what this is talking about. This is speaking of who can enter into the congregation. So are you saying an Edomite can enter into the congregation? No, this is speaking of ultimately the chosen lineage. Okay, let's get the book of Hosea 12 and 12 and we'll end it off. There's so much history that can we can go into, but we just want to keep it to the point Hosea 12 and 12 and Jacob fled into the country of Syria all right and Israel served for a wife all right um, and for a wife he kept sheep and what is this talking about okay he fled into the land of Syria going back to when he went to Laban okay Going to that history we just went into. He was told to go to Padana Ram. All right. And get a wife from Laban's daughters. All right. And Laban. All right. Is one of Abram's descendants through his brothers. Okay. Then we go to Genesis 29. And what did Laban tell him? Genesis 29 and 15. And Laban said unto Jacob. Because thou art my brother. All right. My flesh and my bone. Right? You're of my lineage. We're, we're the same family. Look, I'm going to take care of you. Point blank period. Hopefully I'll edify it on to the next. Shalom.